This is the beginning of one of my uh, favorite weeks, and, and also it, it starts us on uh, just a path of celebration that, that we're going to feel together this week, but also after this week, we get to start the advent of Pentecost, which is even, uh, I mean, it, just, it means, all that means is that the party just never has to stop. And so we get to do that today. But in January, if you're with us in January, we started our Holy Week preparation on the second Sunday of January. We started getting ready for this, and now it's, it's here, which is just awesome. We stepped off on a, on a journey through the Gospel of John that was in, an intentional eye towards the, the revelations of glory that we find in the text. Woven into the journey, we had our Lent celebration, our 40 days of experiencing God, and the confluence of these two journeys is the reality that God is real, that God is active, that God is present for us, but God's also real and active and present through us. With that as our thread, we're going to enter Holy Week together to celebrate the the glorification that gives weight to the felt presence. The sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus the Christ that creates a path to reconcile with God and rescue creation from chaos to order. Today around the world, Christians are marking the beginning of this week by commemorating Palm Sunday. We mark the occasion with Sideshow Bob. Most days he's relegated to my office. Um, he kind of brightens up the, the, the ambience, if you will. Um, he makes it uh, very bright and sunny every day. And so I share him with you today. Oh. This, though, the events of Palm Sunday, the gravity of Palm Sunday, the joy of Palm Sunday, the tragedy of Palm Sunday, all of this speaks to the meta narrative reality of Scripture. That, that all things, everything from, from Genesis 1 all the way through, everything in Scripture points to Jesus. Everything points to Jesus and God's one plan to reconcile the world. With that context, with that in mind, with Palm Sunday rooted in the Old Testament and the life of the nation of Israel, we're going to start today with the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 9. Rejoice, O people of Zion! Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem! Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. I will remove the battle chariots from Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem. I will destroy all the weapons used in battle, and your king will bring peace to the nations. That was written about 550-ish years before the events of Palm Sunday, written during the exile, right before that that four-century period of of silence began when prophetic words ceased and God's presence did not reside in the temple. Now, remember that, that at one time, the nation of Israel was thriving. The kingdom grew. There was plenty to eat. There was comfort. There was safety. There was peace. And in that comfort and safety, the nation, from the several kings all the way down, though they experienced that peace, they forgot where their peace came from. That peace came from God, or more more accurately, more properly, it came from a properly ordered relationship with God where each person operated in their created capacity. God was the center of order, and people responded to this order by working out his will through this threefold mission that he gave the nation of Israel to multiply, to fill, and to rule. Now, as the nation of Israel pressed deeper into the comfort that the peace gave them, they followed the pattern that many of us have followed as well. In a desire to replace God as the center of order, they found themselves in a pretty scary place. God gave them what they were asking for. And that can be pretty terrifying. 
he allowed them to be the center of their own order. As they responded to their comfort by replacing God, God allowed himself to be replaced. And like it does for us, when God is not the center of our order, it led to the destruction of the peace that the nation of Israel knew. They were conquered again and again. They were spread to the ends of the known world. Their heritage is lost. No longer the power of the world, the nation of Israel was at the mercy of Darius the Mede, Xerxes the Persian, Alexander the Greek, and finally the Romans. They're conquered. Then their conquerors are conquered, and then their conquerors are conquered by conquerors, and they're farther and farther away from the peace that they once knew, and now they're separated by centuries from that reality. One of the final voices of the prophetic age, Zechariah, gives a picture of God's rescue, a coming king that would set the nation free. He would bring victory and peace and salvation. But there's a problem with that. And there's a problem with how the nation of Israel would interact with that. See, the prophecy called for peace to the nations when after all of the years of oppression when after all of the the hardship, all of the separation, all of the isolation, all of the loss, all of the abuse, all of the famine, all of the misfortune, all of the political slavery, the nation of Israel spread throughout the conquered world, wanted peace from the nations rather than peace to the nations. Their suffering led to their mission not being connected to the mission of God. Now, hitting fast forward, bringing us up 550 years from the prophet Zechariah, the event captured in Matthew 21, Jesus entering Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey, bringing this prophecy into fruition in the midst of a crowd that's crying out for a Savior. They're crying out for Messiah. They're crying out for rescue. They lay down palm fronds and even their own clothes uh, down in front of of Jesus uh, as they're hoping for rescue from what holds them captive. But they don't really understand what their captor is or what they need freedom from. Now Jesus had been known, he'd been made known, And and through this knowledge, there's a diversity of thought about who he actually was. As he's coming into Jerusalem, who is this man? Is he a prophet? Is he a teacher? Is he a lunatic? Is this the Messiah? Could he really be the Messiah? See, the word is out about, about what he had been doing, about the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the teachings, the attacking of the religious uh, structures that control Jewish, Jewish life. His glory, his felt presence had been experienced. But because the people did not understand what was holding them captive, they missed the mission, and soon they would miss the Messiah. From that moment captured in Matthew 21, moving backwards again, jumping over the historical timeline 200 years before Jesus would enter Jerusalem, on Palm Sunday, in, in the 160s-ish B.C., we can look back at this moment to understand the problem and the solution that the nation of Israel was looking for. The nation of Israel, dispersed all over the known world, were pushed too far by the oppression of their conquerors, and they revolted. This revolt was against the Greeks, and then again it was against the Romans. The ancient historian Josephus and, and also, the, in the Apocrypha, First and Second uh, Maccabees captures this, gives us a picture of what happened. And, and the alternate name for this, uh, for this war is the Maccabean Revolution. This is the story of Judas Maccabeus, whom many people thought had to be the Messiah because of what he did and how he did it. 
in the midst of, of this time of oppression, this response to the oppression, getting pushed too far. Israel needed a leader. And Judas Maccabeus steps up. This dude is an action hero for the ages. He makes Hollywood action heroes look like a bunch of play-acting pansies. William Wallace pales in comparison to Judas Maccabeus. This guy is always outnumbered. Always outnumbered, he fights. He instilled a pride and a hope in the people because he took what little he had and with reckless abandon, he defeated the oppressors and brought peace and independence to the nation of Israel for a time. After one battle, he rode into Jerusalem. He rode to the temple through the streets of Jerusalem. And the people laid down their coats and palm fronds in front of Judas Maccabeus and his war horse. He was entering Jerusalem as a conquering king. This is what the people were looking for. They weren't looking for order. They were looking for a leader that would help them rule the chaos. The glory of Jesus spoke to a humiliating sacrifice, not a conquering hero. And this discrepancy would lead the crowd in a few short days to adjust their cry from Hosanna to crucify him. Glory misunderstood because mission is misunderstood. Not victory to be in power, but victory to submit to the order that the power of God brings. And so with that as the backdrop of what we celebrate today, we begin in John chapter 18 in our journey, beholding glory. After saying these things, Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley with his disciples and entered a grove of olive trees. Judas the betrayer knew this place because Jesus had gone there with his disciples. The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Now we started talking about this what this um, evening several weeks ago when we got into John chapter 13. We're now in John 18. And so earlier in, in this evening, the 12 had gathered with Jesus for dinner as a part of a celebration of the coming Passover Sabbath. As they gathered, they were met with a huge cultural and, uh, and violation of etiquette on the part of Jesus that set the tone for the supper a supper that we will celebrate together this coming Thursday. Before they ate, Jesus took on the task of a slave to illustrate the point. The point of his ministry. And in that point, he gives final instructions followed by a commissioning that calls the twelve to do the stuff that Jesus had done. The point that Jesus made includes how glory would be felt by the twelve, but also how glory would be felt through the twelve. By extension, this is how glory will be felt by us. It's how glory will be felt through us. The glory that Jesus was about to enter into was the the sacrificial act that would give even more weight to his presence. And it'll also reveal the character of God. All of this is going to be displayed by the action that he's about to take. This action on our behalf. We'll see him beaten, slandered, abused, ridiculed, humiliated, tortured, and executed 
in the most barbaric way the empire of Rome had yet devised, which is saying something. Nailed to a cross to slowly suffocate as his lungs filled with blood and his strength gave out so he could no longer push himself up to take a breath. For me and for you, And with that reality, we also know the reality that there's even more than just that. We know that because Jesus is using his glory to replicate glory. This teaching that began with foot washing was given context with a new commandment, a commandment that if followed pushes back against the chaos of a world lived apart from the order of the creator God. We together as a church are called to love one another enough to allow our vineyard family to make a mess on the floor, and then we get to clean it up. Grace to their grime. But also, their grace to our grime. My grace to your grime, and your grace to mine. After this teaching, Judas leaves the party, to set the betrayal in motion. And Jesus continues to instruct. He calls the 12 to be like him, to watch what he's about to do, and to take note, not for information, but for application. Jesus is about to show the 12 the path to take after they put down their selfish ways and pick up their cross. They finish their meal. They leave the upper room and they head to the garden. They leave through a gate. They go down a steep valley to cross the Kidron Creek. This is a highly symbolic route. Throughout Scripture, this route suggests suffering and defeat because of oppression and idolatry. It's really interesting about this creek. This creek is more of, of a wadi. And if you've been in, in this part of the world, um, and you, you know a, a wadi is not filled with water all the time. After a rain, after, um, after the, the rain would come, it would flow, but it is not, it, it's a seasonal creek. But the Kidron Creek, especially where Jesus crossed the Kidron Creek, was connected to a channel that led to the altar in the temple. And this is Passover week. All week long, in preparation for Passover, on the altar of the temple, Passover lambs were being slaughtered, offerings made by the hundreds of thousands of pilgrims that would be in Jerusalem for Passover. Hundreds of thousands of lambs slaughtered on the altar, their blood running from the altar into the Kidron. As Jesus crosses the creek, the water would still be red from the blood of the lambs. Jesus heads to the garden for the final moments before his arrest through the valley and over the blood spilled as sacrifice. Back in our text today, John 18, 4 through 11, Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him, so he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for, he asked. Jesus is the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. As Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Once more he asked them, who are you looking for? And again they replied, Jesus, the Nazarene. I told you that I am he, Jesus said, and since I am the one you want, let these others go. 
He did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not lose a single one of those you have given me. Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? Vineyard, as we begin Holy Week together, we do so with this set into our mind. Remember our theme of glory and the commissioning that Jesus gave the twelve, by extension, the commissioning that he passed on to all of us. Jesus is demonstrating a response to the world that leads to the feltness of his presence. The way he faces this mob, this army coming to attempt to force him into conformity, the way he faces this mob is leadership by example. This scene exemplifies courage. Courage likely that the mob did not think that he had. This midnight garden meeting happened in the midst of a full moon. And this full moon, especially in in this part of the world, it gives light enough to see a path, definitely, Light enough to know where you're going. Light enough that people could travel without much more illumination. But the mob comes with torches and lamps, fully expecting that Jesus is going to flee and that they would have to search for him in the trees. But vineyard glory doesn't run. Jesus meets them and clearly testifies to his identity I am he. This example is also an example of authority. Courage, but also authority. After he declares who he is, the mob. You think about mobs. You think about this contingent of of soldiers, contingent of guards. They came for one man with hundreds. After he declares who he is, the hundreds to this one that are armed to the teeth, step back and bow down. There is recognition here that he is stronger than his enemies. And we note then that he is stronger than the enemy. The world, the enemy, recognizes the strength of Jesus Standing alone, this is the greatest force the world has ever known. With courage and authority, next, Jesus shows that he chose to die. This is another example for us. Clearly, what we see in this passage is that he had the power to escape death. He could have walked right through the crowd as they hit their knees. He didn't run. He didn't escape. He even helped his enemies arrest him. He chose to die. He chose to sacrifice. He chose to take the place of humiliating service. And after that, we see an example, another example. This example is an example of protective love. As he makes it easier to be arrested by this mob, he gives the disciples a chance to escape. He says, here I am. I'm the one that you want. He covers his followers with protection so that they might be spared. The missional bent of this is huge. This protective love ensures that we're able to speak about this example today because the disciples would learn from this moment record this moment, and pass it on to us. 
Finally, the example of Jesus at his, at his arrest is also an example of obedience. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering that the Father has given me? God's will be done. Faithful to the mission, regardless of, it, of what it meant for his comfort, for his health, for his safety. Utter obedience to the will of God as he works out his plan for reconciling the world. Faithfulness even unto death. Where Judas Maccabeus came to bring peace from nations. Jesus demonstrates an act that brings peace to the nations. So Vineyard, as we begin Holy Week together, we do so with the posture exemplified by Jesus in the garden. And honestly, the only way I know to do this is to do it together. We stand with courage because he has overcome the world. We stand with authority because he is one with the Father and we are joined to him. We choose sacrifice over selfishness. We submit to the will of the Father over our own will and trust that even if it leads to sorrow, our sorrow will be turned to joy. We've traveled together through this presentation of glory that is the life and ministry of Jesus. Now is the act that gives full weight to the felt presence of God. That act is at hand. We are invited into the narrative of reconciliation by being reconciled and becoming reconcilers. So together, we move into Holy Week to celebrate what was done and to prepare to do it ourselves. Amen.